let's uh i think we could try to start a little early and i'm not actually gonna live code this uh because it's gonna take a little while to do that <laughs> so i hope no one's like that upset about that <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh well, we'll go ahead and go all right um if if anyone's bothered by <laughs> the the, <laughs> the theme i am trying to get used to this because i think uh I think this is what I'm going to use for sliced. I apologize for your theme. It's it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I can grow to like it. Yeah. Let's increase the size a little bit. Um, so I, I worked with Tan on getting the, uh, the cursive font in here. I really wanted to do that. <laughs> it actually just like, you guys should try it out. Like you feel like flashier when you're coding. Like uh, I feel like, you know, uh, implicitly, it makes me code with a little bit more flair. <laughs> uh, I, I spend too much time telling or showing people how to do things, and like if they if I share my screen, I don't want it to be where they're like, "How do you type an arrow?" So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe if like if you have like a production environment, you know how people companies <laughs> typically make their production environment look different. Yeah, they do. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, so. I'll start off. Um, here's also, a, yeah. So I am going to use a little bit of Keras here. So I did take time to basically follow some of their instructions for installing it. And it's on the TensorFlow uh, R website. Um, I think the one thing I did that was slightly different is like I didn't use Miniconda. I already have Anaconda. So it's like I'm not going to install another Miniconda and deal with that. Um, so you just have to be kind of careful with like, uh, I don't know, working with environments and Anaconda and all that. Um, and I, so I ended up creating an environment named TF here. And the one thing I found that was kind of weird about this, um, it's like, I also had to set the reticulate Python and the system environment uh, variable, um, like while also using the reticulate use conda env. So it's like, you have to do both, which seems like it defeats the purpose of calling a use conda env, uh, cause it's supposed to use the Python in that environment. But for some reason, at least I was having issues if I didn't do both of those things. Uh, okay, so let's. Uh, so the data set I'm working with today, maybe I'll just start with it. You can kind of read the title here. It's called Pokemon. Uh, so this is like has all six generations of Pokemon in it, uh, including some of their various stats. Like I, so I'm only familiar really with the first uh, generation of Pokemon. Um, so maybe more, maybe other people are more informed than I am. Um, but you know, each of them comes with like ratings from zero to a, or one to a hundred for these various various like attributes. So attack, defense, special attack, special defense, speed, and HP. I think HP is like health. Um, and I think uh, so. In this data set, they um, they have a couple of character variables here. So name, obviously the the name of the Pokemon. And in fact, let me just print out like the first several here. So like Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, Venusaur, um, and a couple of these kind of classes. So you got your main class, Grass, and your kind of secondary class, Poison. And if you, I don't know, if you know the characters, this makes sense to you. If you don't, I don't know, just think of them as like special powers or unique traits about each uh, Pokemon animal. Um, so anyways, uh, I thought this was a kind of a neat data set. Uh, it's not that big. So they see there's 800 rows here. Um, we're not even going to use all of them um, because uh, part of this is the interesting part about the modeling for this is like there's some, like some structural nature to this. So if you know Pokemon, you know Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, Venusaur, and then there's like Venusaur, Mega Venusaur. Uh, these are all related. They're like just uh, evolutions of the original Bulbasaur. Um, so you kind of, you know, you get some redundancy with the data essentially. And really, I guess, I guess me modeling this, I was more interested in like the unique Pokemon, not so much their uh, new evolutions. Um, so I just do kind of something simple here to like filter for the first Nietzsche uh, uh, grouping. Um, so that actually, um, actually what I do is I filter out the, like these definitely redundant, like Mega Venusaur is like redundant with Venusaur. So I beta, based it off a number here. I think I really did want to like uh, reduce it just down to like the first in the evolution, but I didn't know of an easy way to do it based just based off the data. 
here because it doesn't ideally it would tell you these four are related to each other and you just pick the first one um and instead i couldn't really do that so i just pick like the first one of of, of each uh, specific number here so don't we don't really have like a true unique identifier here um so I, you know i was just trying to create like a simple version of this so i'm like okay let me create make number kind of the unique identifier here uh name just being like a characteristic describing number um yeah, hey, uh, Tony, just a quick question. Yeah. Did you manually create that number column or was that part of the data? That was part of the data set. Um, so, I, yeah, I think they were mostly concerned with distinguishing these like mega versions, right? You see a mega Charizard, mega Charizard. It was just an easy way to get rid of these extra mega versions. I'm not even really sure what the mega versions are. Um, anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's like a bunch of type one. So I think... Um, Type one is what we're going to end up trying to model. We're going to try to model, like, can we tell based off the various attributes what type of species it is it? Um, and so you'll see I'm, I'm going to reduce it here to five. I think there was like, you know, 18 or 20. Or, you actually get this from the schema printout. So it says 18 unique here. And you could do, you could do like a simple count. In fact, uh, I do this for count two, the secondary species here, but you can do it for count one as well. Uh, well, if I don't filter. Um, so you see, I'll take, I took like five, I think the f five top uh, species and just excluded psychic. I guess I could have also done that, but you see like the count number starts dwindling here. So if you wanted to create a harder modeling problem for yourself, you could do that. But I was like, no, let's keep this a little easier. Um, so let's, let's just have five classes and I go ahead and start doing a little bit of pre-processing of actually you don't really need to change legendary to integer. I think if it's a double and that always just hate, I always hate that when it's like a zero one and it's an, it's a double. And I was like, can we just turn this into integer? And it's like, it doesn't really matter, but I always like to, um, to change that. And then the generation number. So there's six generations. Um, and you'll see like the first 150 rows are generation one. So I want to model this as like a dummy instead of, uh, as a like just an integer or, or a double. Um, I think that's, uh, you could play around with that and see if it works better, just keeping that as a one through six. But I kind of see that as like a, you know, a factor, in this case, an ordered uh, factor. Um, so yeah, let me run the DF fields line. And so we're going to start um, kind of like the normal tidy models process, right? You do your train test um, split process here. Um, and default CV, I think we all are uh, familiar with that. So here, just using the default 10 volt split uh, and then creating a, like a simple formula. And you don't have to do this. I think I explained this when I was doing chapter 15 is like, I like to parameterize this column Y almost like a, as if I was like writing a function in a way, because it, it's almost everywhere. So if you like suddenly decide, oh, I want to try out modeling type two, you can do that pretty quickly. So. Uh, yeah, I think we did full form. Uh, so we do an initial recipe here. So the, I guess the main thing I'm taking out the type two because like it was two. There was a lot of NAs, and I was like, let me. I just didn't want to concern myself with it. Um, total because and I actually didn't check this. Total should be like probably like a linear combination of some of the attributes. Uh, I don't know, I should have checked. Yeah, I think it's probably like a sum of these attributes. So that's not something I'm gonna include in the, the model. It's just gonna be redundant information. Um, and, you know, taking out the name and numbers, like I'm gonna keep this in the data set. So when we're looking at, um, you know, doing the predictions and stuff, you, you have it alongside your data, but you're not actually using it to predict anything. Um, and I, I do like to add this near zero variant stuff. Um, just because maybe some of these are kind of overlapping information. And I'd, I guess I could have done more EDA to really check for that. Um, but that's kind of a, a fun little step to use. Um, and so here I had the idea. I also, while I'm at this whole workflow sets thing, I wanted to try out what is what really is the difference uh, because we're going to end up using with, um, a random forest classifier for one of these. I really wanted to see, OK, what is there a difference if I don't normalize versus if I do? My hypothesis, and we'll see how this turns out, 
my hypothesis is that you should normalize. I mean, that's just the general best practice with random forest. You kind of just leave the variable as is. My thought is like normalizing probably actually hurts it because you, I feel like you compress information a little bit doing uh, it that way. But, uh, you know, for something like regression or logistic regression, like we'll do, uh, I felt like normalizing is probably good for that. Um, so you'll see I'm setting up a couple of the specifications here. Uh, Glimnet um, for you know our elastic net, um, and we'll just go ahead and start tuning or asking to tune things. So we're not really setting anything yet. We want the whole workflow sets uh, training process to figure this out for us. Uh, for random forest, I went ahead and set trees. Um, I don't remember where I saw this or read this, but I thought like it's usually a good idea to kind of like pre-specify trees, um, maybe like depending on the size of your data set. And I don't want it, trees to be like more than the number of rows in my data set. I think I had like 200 or something uh, in the, the training set, I had 278. So I was like, let's do like something slightly uh, less than like half of it. So I guess it's like a closer to like 20% of it. So maybe I could have increased this a little bit. Um, and really you maybe would want to tune it if you're like trying out everything. Um, but I went ahead and just left it as is. Um, so I wanted to try out the neural nets uh, engine for the multinomial regression um, uh, function. Uh, I learned from the documentation that it doesn't, it's not like GlimNet where you can also have a mixture term. You only have the penalty term. Um, same thing with Keras, you only have the penalty term, um, which I thought was a little bit interesting here. And I. I guess I was throwing in Keras here. I was like, is this going to help like with multinomial regression or I guess classification? I'm, I'm actually not really sure why the function is called multinomial reg because this is like classification. I guess maybe it's like using like a, a linear transformation at the end for, I don't know, at least for this neural net and Keras, uh, like also a neural net. Maybe it's doing like a linear transformation to figure out which class, um, you know, after the one layer uh, of the neural net. Uh, I'm not really sure. I, I need to look, probably read the documentation a little bit closer on that. Um, and in fact, I was so interested. I was like, you know what? There's an MLP uh, function that you can also use with the Keras engine. Um, I want to see what's the difference between these things. Uh, so I went ahead and did those, both of those things. Um, I think you can actually, so if I go here and type translate, it'll show Okay, Keras MLP, missing arg, missing arg, hidden units, penalty, tune. And if I do the same thing with the, the non-MLP, it's also Keras MLP, X, Y, tune, verbose hidden units. So this does one hidden unit. This is tuning the hidden units. Uh, one hidden unit inside is like, I guess activation function is linear. So this is like more like a true, like one layer neural net. Whereas I, I don't really know what this is doing, honestly. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see how it's both the Keras MLP, but I don't know, depending on the interface you use from Parsnip, you kind of get an underlying difference um, modeling function. Uh, so yeah, I was like kind of curious in how this is all gonna look. And since I have time, I was like, okay, let me just run this offline. Um, you know, of course here, we got your uh, the part where you're you got a preproc proc um, argument and your models arguments, and these are both both take lists um, here. And I want to try out both recipes for all five different, uh, I guess, model frameworks we have here. Uh, so this is like 10 different type of recipe model combinations in total. Uh, yeah, so you see 10 here. Uh, and of course, this is going to take a little while to run. Um, so this is actually what I do in notebooks, uh, like some version of this with like the chunks um, where I'm like, okay, here's what I want the file. Uh, here's, I'm going to save this to file at some point. Here's what the path to the file is. You know, I'm calling it resgrid. I save it in RDS format. And so the first thing I do here is like, okay, does it already exist? Um, that's essentially what I'm asking here. And if it doesn't exist, then not, then I'm going to run. Uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the actual, um, workflow map later. So uh, this is mainly helpful, obviously, for like 
you know, notebooks, especially like with slides, right? And maybe I do this once, my notebook crashes later, and I might come back and I don't want to have, have lost all my results. So this is like particularly, you know, thinking for that kind of case. Um, it can also be useful if you have like some Bayesian model that takes like 12 hours to run. You save it one day and we want to come back to it at another point. So um, in this case, I'm curious in uh, minimizing log loss. Uh, so that's what my metric set is here, met set. Um, and I, I think, uh, so I do this uh, thing. I have like this small package to write um, to time a function. Um, and it's not, that's not the only thing that this package does, but uh, I guess I was doing this offline um, uh, just to time it. And you see uh, the workflow map ended up taking about 10 minutes. Um, so not that much, but essentially what it's doing is like, okay, here's, here's the actions I want to do. And, you know, time, uh, right. Um, have a time uh, decorator around that. Um, I feel like I'm using Python terminology there, <laughs> decorator. Um, but what we saw last week with, uh, I think Osman showed control race, which is uh, kind of a cool, like slightly, maybe, I don't know if optimized version, uh, maybe that's the right way of describing it, or just like an interesting way of doing, um, you know, searching through all your models and trying to find the best model. Uh, we have that, I guess the whole, tune race ANOVA approach, right? Where we like um, kind of like search through different models. And if we feel like we're, you know, we hit a bunch of bad models, we're going to just stop that, uh, searching for models of that type. Um, at least that's the way I sort of understand it. Um, and I think uh, last week I had asked, I think I had asked, um, you know, should we always be using uh, this ANOVA approach? Because it seems like it just saves you time and possibly Compu you know, computation as well, as well. And maybe you miss out on like one extra, maybe the, like the most optimal model is on something you stop early and never actually test because of this approach, but that's pretty unlikely. Um, so I was reading through, I think the draft of one of the chapters and I noticed, and this is kind of small, I guess. Uh, Max, I think, or whoever, Max or Julia, whoever wrote this, Kind of address this question where they basically said um is it in one of these rmd notes but they basically said like they found that using the tune race anova and then using stacks um it was good to to use a tune race anova because it ends up uh, you know throwing out to models that you don't won't even make it to stacks um you know stacks won't choose uh, whenever it evaluates all possible sub models so they kind of suggest you know it's fine using it in combination with stacks. Um, I will find that quote somewhere in here, but it's in that draft chapter with uh, workflow sets and stacks. Uh, so yeah, that took about, uh, I think 18 minutes actually when I added the care specs. Um, so, you know, for me thinking I had to slice, this is perfectly fine, you know, in a two hour time span. Uh, so I'll read the results in and we can plot them and see how they look. Uh, but, and clearly there were some <laughs> that were fit pretty badly here. Um, so I need a, I could look into this more. I think this was the Keras um, multinomial reg uh, model, but you see like, you know, generally everything else was um, pretty close. And maybe I, I need to like actually filter out some of these but, uh, to get a closer look at this whole spectrum of other models here. Um, but I thought that was kind of interesting. You can kind of, you clearly see that some of them were bad. I think uh, the other thing you see here is random forest, if you can see the colors. Um, the random forest ones seem to do better than, you know, the, all the almost all the other models. Um, um, so moving on, you'll see, I see that there were 599 models run. That is an odd number. Or, um, just because we chose that tune race to Nova approach where it threw out some models or didn't even try some models. Um, so I think you would normally see that at like some even number. In fact, if I, had a, I chose grid 10, so there should be like 10 combinations of um, 10 different parameter sets for each of those five model frameworks and two recipes. So 10 times, how does that math work? If there's two recipes, five model frameworks, so that's 10 combinations, then there's 10 parameters. I mean, that's only a hundred, I guess. So there's more, 
maybe there's more parameters. So maybe grid 10 means one for each hyperparameter. Forgot. Circle that. Uh, doesn't describe it in here. Okay, that's fine. Anyways, I was just kind of interested in how many models I'd run. So that's a quick way of seeing that. I um, don't think this comment applies. So just looking at the best models, you know, we see numerically what we had seen before, two random forest models, uh, normalized and base, base being the non-normalized predictors um, did the best. And like you see that they're basically tied here if you just look at the average log loss. So maybe the pre-processing didn't really change anything at all. Um, see the glim nets overall, they're 12th and 13th, but those are the best of the glim nets. Um, and then the Keras ones, they probably did, needed to do a lot more uh, hyperparameter tuning to really get those to work. Uh, so the next thing, doing is to try to eke out every like little digit of uh, log loss here is I'm going to do the stacks. And we went over this uh, a little bit last week, or we did go over this last week. Um, it's pretty, it makes it pretty simple. Uh, simple. Um, so it runs a glim nets uh, for you. And I won't run this, tick it takes about three minutes. Um, but it's pretty straightforward code, right? You, you initialize this like a, like a workflow, uh, just saying workflow and then add, instead of add model or add a recipe, it's add candidates. Uh, and you can just pass in your whole, uh, you know, ANOVA grid here, and it'll figure out what to do with it. That is the real magic that I find kind of awesome. Um, and then, you, you know, there's only two steps here, blend predictions. Uh, so this is like actually identifying which of those 599 models, you know, do we want to keep? And then once it figures out, okay, I want, you know, like these 20, then it figures out, okay, here with fit members, it figures out what coefficients to, you know, to use for that final net model. Um, for me, I, <laughs> this is something I do. I put a beep, <laughs> beep or beep. Uh, I don't know if you guys would be able to hear this, but like, especially if I'm like not paying attention for like 10 minutes and I'm just waiting for a model to run, is like play some like little music uh, to like tell you, oh, this is done running. Um, I also test this uh, offline just to see how long this would take. Uh, but I can read the results in now. Um, and just reading through, in fact, actually just doing uh, stacks, triple dot, auto plot. I was curious, like, um, what type of like auto plots you could do here. Uh, can you can you back up for a second to the. Yeah the ranking of models, we're getting confusion in the chats of what it's showing exactly. Like you lost, you said it, but you said it fast. <laughs> the, so the result ranks? Yeah. Or, okay. I think. So I'm using, I'm ranking results by mean long loss. And in fact, that was the only metric I'd even passed to it. So I don't, I'm wondering if I even needed to specify that there. <laughs> uh, so I guess it's a little overkill. Uh, especially like filtering, I guess you wouldn't need to actually filter for log loss if you only have one metric. Um, but sometimes you might p pass in like ROC, AUC for, to this um, and have two metrics. Uh, so I guess then you were showing the top for each workflow ID basically, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I did skip over that. So okay. I were, yeah, for each type of model, uh, I was showing the best ranking type for each of those models. But the rank itself, you know, right? It wasn't like one, two, three, four, five, right. you know, eight. Okay. Um, it was like amongst the 40 models, uh, you know, these, like this was its rank amongst all of them. So I think probably random forest was like one through 11. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's what we were trying to make sure we were following, so. Cool. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going, I'm going a little too fast. That's yeah. definitely my tendency. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we are, we're here blend predictions or figure out which of the 599 models we want to use and fit members finding the coefficients to use uh, in your you know, whole GlimNet training process. Um, and I was just loaded this in. And so let's see, it has a nice printout here. Actually, so it only really evaluated 156 possible candidates. 
um, and only retain then only retain five. Um, and you can see, okay, here's the weighting for each of these uh, candidate models. And I find this pretty interesting. It chose like a GlimNet model as the highest, uh, as having the highest weight here. That's, uh, I guess that's the power of stacks, right? Like it figures out the best like of the combinations of models. Um, so maybe it's like, it can be unintuitive compared to just our normal result ranks. Uh, not really sure what to read into that, honestly. Um, anyways, um, I was curious of the different autoplot uh, functionalities uh, offered by Stacks. So it has one, the first one, it actually has three types. So performance is what you get if you don't specify anything. And this kind of just shows us, okay, our specified uh, loss function, mean long loss, and the number of members. Um, so you, I think it said in the printout, it started off with, so okay, yeah, now I'm a little confused because like it says 156 possible candidates, but it's clear it's like around like 200 or you know, almost 300, yeah, 275 uh, number of models. <laughs> I'm not really, maybe I'm reading, reading this wrong. Um, I guess it's like a lot of models or maybe this, is, maybe this doesn't represent models. Um, not really sure, honestly. Um, but you know, I, I guess maybe you're trying to read into like. In fact, I'm, I'm now I'm trying to think like, how do you interpret this uh, this graph here? Um, so I guess if they both have the same x x axis, uh, like, can do, do both of these x axis like are these do these match? Are these the same scale? Not really sure, because <laughs> log loss. Let's see, lower log loss. Um, would be to the left, and that lower log loss is better. Um, but it's high here. <laughs> okay, okay. L let's just uh, let's let's uh, let me hand wave and say you could use this for your performance. I'm not really sure how to interpret that at this point. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and look at uh, the weights here. Um, so this is basically uh, giving us information from our printout in a bar chart form. Um, and I guess the different, uh, so the different classes here, I think it's only the model kind of was trained such that it's only going to predict fire and normal, which is obviously not great. Cause I think if you remember from the beginning, we had like five different classes. Um, so maybe it's like, um, it's favoring log loss, but like really, um, I guess what, which is like precision or recall here where it's like, there's always gonna be like, uh, you know, false positives for these classes and then like false negatives for the other three classes, just the way this has been trained. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting to try to interpret this for for a, no, a multinomial um, prediction problem. Cause like, what do these weights, like, what does this weight really mean? I guess we see the weight uh, the same model, the member here for the 109 GlimNet is has both a weighting for the normal class and then also again for the normal class. So how does this have, oh, okay, the preprocessor. Norm and base are different here. That's interesting. Huh. I guess it's just showing that the complexity of this can get pretty high when you're doing a multinomial classification problem. And, and I'm actually not even sure if like stacks is like, should should I even be doing that for um, for multinomial uh, classification? I think I think it's fine, but I'm honestly not sure. I just thought it was kind of a worth trying out to see how this would go. Um, anyways, I figured I would show that functionality, uh, and then finally the members plot. And again, here so average number of members on the x-axis. And you see this goes up to like two seventy five. And you see, as we reduce members, we actually improve our log loss. So we, I guess, we we're clearly overfitting um, at some point over here, or trying to use too much data, and it wasn't working for us. And as we reduced uh, candidate members down to five, we got something much more reasonable and much better for our main log loss. Uh, so I think this is. I saw this in um, the chapter, the next chapter, right up. And it's not really that useful for for our case because we only have five predictions, but apparently stacks has this thing to this function to help extract like the top um, models. 
because uh, it's a pretty complex. I know the printout's nice, but um, you know, it's not like a data. Yeah, it's got a, a lot of things in it, right? Just like a, like a recipe has like a lot of things in it. So it's not something you really want to mess with, at least like looking at it, just uh, straight at it. You know, maybe data stack as like, I don't know what this is. I think you know, all the data it uses to train, to build the um, ensemble model. Um, I guess, uh, but this is uh, maybe an interesting function to be aware of. It's not even exported from Stack, so maybe we shouldn't be using it. I don't know. Uh, anyways, uh, let's go in down to actually evaluating um, this final Stacks model. So uh, there's like a, a couple of things I wanted to look at, which is right, the mean log loss. But I did want to also plot a you know confidence matrix, um, a confusion matrix. Sorry. Um, and you know, one of these, the mean log loss, it requires probabilities, and the confusion matrix just requires straight up prediction. So I don't know, there's maybe a more efficient ways to do this, but I was like, okay, let me do both the probabilities and predictions, and then um, return metrics and the confusion matrix. Let me just return this all on a list because I want to do this both for the training set and the test set. And maybe this is like an ugly way of doing it, uh, but I was like, let me return a list. And this is where I like Python, where you can return like four or five things at one time. But we have the zealot package uh, to kind of help us with this, right? And maybe it's a little weird looking operator here um, to, to do that. But um, I think this is kind of useful. And I don't know what's happening in Fred's train. I found train. Oh. It's one of those things where you you write it out in plain code and then you put it in a function and then you forget to change the name of some of the variables uh, afterwards. Um, name and scope. Yeah. Uh, so looking at the training and test metrics and you could like bind this together, but so it's still a little overfit here because our training log loss is, I don't know, probably like non-trivially better than our test log loss here. Um, and I think probably some of that has to do with what I mentioned at the top, where some of the Pokemon are inherently related to each other via evolution. So it's like, maybe we should have done like a group fold, um, a grouped you know, V fold. Um, and there is a function to do that in our sample, but it just, we didn't have a variable like indicating, okay, which is an evolution of another. Um, but I, I think that's my thought there. There's probably some, yeah. yeah, I was going to say just if that's a case where if this were like a real thing that you would, I would definitely want to go find that data set to, to do that grouping because yeah, they can definitely cause, I mean, it seems likely that they could cause problems. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm highly aware of this because like, I think I, at least two of the sliced uh, for the, you know, they had four episodes already, two of them had like grouped hierarchical data like this. Um, or you have to be careful with that, like the data leakage, right? Because you will you will get penalized with it uh, just because they have a true holdout set that you don't you can't even you don't what, even know what the actuals are um, for so for that you know that competition. So it's like even though your train um, you know split looks good, and even your test split if it has like an actual may look good, it may like just really suffer on like a true holdout. Uh, so just things to be like really aware of. But I think that was my hypothesis running through this like earlier. Um, and I was like, I don't really want to work with this anymore. I thought it would give core like a shout out, just to look at, okay, let me look at the probabilities returned um, and see like which classes are kind of correlated to each other based off, you know, from our predictions, like uh, which have like, you know, right, if we have a whole one to distribute in probability, are there classes where there's like a 0.5 and a 0.5 and they almost, they're almost always like equally predicted uh, together like, like telling us maybe there's like some fundamental relationship between those uh, uh, just from our predictions uh, so you see you know normal and grass uh, kind of at this dot here seem to be you know relatively you know predicted relatively uh, differently like uh, so negative correlation so where red is negative one here uh, but you see some other places where the blue dots high um, and there is like some positive correlation between two classes. So uh, just something, I guess, kind of interesting to look at when you're evaluating, what, why is my model predicting the way it is? Um, 
So with the confusion matrix, uh, they have some pretty cool functions here and uh, exploring, I think they have two types of auto plots. This one that's auto, uh, the, the mosaic type. And I guess that's, it gets its name from uh, the geom type here. Um, and I think, I think these aren't predicted at all. Maybe the, this is easier to see in the heat map. Yeah, see some of these classes aren't predicted at all. Um, and I, and we saw this, I think earlier with the, the stack model, it was only um, predicting two classes. I thought, I thought it was like normal and fire that was only predicting, but here it's showing normal and water. Maybe I coerced um, this factor wrong. I, when I was trying this out, it was giving me uh, errors because like it said my uh, Y column needed to be a factor. So now when I, you know, when I went and looked at the fit ensemble, you see that it predicts, it sometimes predicts fire. In other words, predicts normal. Here it's like showing normal in water. <laughs> so maybe I need to be more careful with how I uh, factor uh, the, the type one column. Uh, Cause otherwise it <laughs> makes it, it tells you something different than what you saw in the stacks output. So I guess these are kind of interesting things to be like aware of as you go through this whole process. Clearly I wasn't like totally prepared here, but I'm just showing you <laughs> uh, kind of what my whole thought process was with this. Um, yeah, I don't think I have no much else here. I think I don't remember what I was trying to do here. Uh, but, you know, kind of trying to explore uh, the whole tiny models ecosystem. Um, really what we can do with it uh, kind of in a on a different type of problem here and just multinomial classification is hard <laughs> um, um, can, I, can you scroll yeah. up a little yeah like um no in the uh console with like the same the yeah that the five highest weighted member classes are okay sorry yeah this table here i'm, I'm trying to interpret it, yeah not I'm, like that's why I was questioning like if stacks is the right thing to do here because like how do I interpret this where like does this when this weighting is when we have some <laughs> uh, variable that meets it meets this model like it'll always predict or it'll predict fire with a 0.67 weighting what does that I guess what does that mean if there's no weighting for the other classes um, I guess I'm not too sure honestly on uh like how to interpret that um just Wait. for hmm no is it that that's the class that's most likely from that member Wait, what's going on Sorry. <laughs> I, I i feel like i'm missing something really basic um okay sorry i don't mean to so right like what we had like you know um Two, it was evaluating apparently 275 models or something around there. Um, and it ended up finding, it likes these five uh, for the, you know, the ensemble prediction. Um, so I think what it means is like, when the, like, yeah, how, how do we like actually interpret the, like this ensemble here? Is it like saying if, if this third member predicts fire um, and then maybe like, what it doesn't matter what the other four predict, then the final prediction will be fire. Um, whereas, like, if these one, two, and four, five predict normal, it uses the weighting to like uh, figure out what's the probability weighting. Um, you know, right? Like, because they each have a majority, but they also each have like a probability weighting of like how by how much of you know. Mm -hmm. What's the margin between that and all the other classes? So it uses a weighting once it figures out, okay, this one's predicting normal, this one's predicting normal, and the other two are as well. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a total right um, interpretation. Uh, and maybe this is like a whole danger of like trying to do too much, right? <laughs> You're like, I'm going to show every like predictive model that I can, then I'm just going to ensemble them. But in the end, you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> um, all right, yeah. Um, well, yeah, sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, if, if anyone else has like a little bit more like knowledge of exactly how this ensembling is, is working, uh, you know, that'd be helpful. <laughs> if not, that's okay. 
I think that's probably my job, honestly. <laughs> I think what this is saying is each model will produce five probabilities, right? Uh, yeah, well. Well, here something's wrong, so it's just saying two. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's definitely like not fit like properly, because yeah. otherwise, I think of it, you would see every class here. Maybe, right. maybe Stax is like trying to reduce it to a certain, like trying to reduce the number of candidates and like disregarding that. Like we should probably have at least one candidate for every class here. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> assuming something's wrong depends. here. Hmm? So it, its model would produce five probabilities. And then the weight is saying, how much of that are we going to weigh by? So for each mo one model, uh, one probability might get a certain weight. And then for the same model, for a different class probability, it will get a different weight. So each, each model can have five different weights for five different classes. Um, but like, I guess like, you know, it shows only two classes here, right? Yeah, but like the members repeat, right? So the member in row one and row five are the same and two and three are the same. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, right? Well, no, I mean, this is, this, these are actually the no, same, yeah. Yeah, 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 no, 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 those aren't the same. Yeah, they're, they're, oh, yeah, yeah, right. right. Like, so it's well, like binary in a way where it's like, okay, this model can only predict have like favor normal, either normal or fire. Oh. And, and we'll huh. take it. I'm not sure actually. Huh. Well, okay, so that's probably how the multinomial is implemented. Like it, that, that object, FIT underscore ENS. Can you see that in the environment? Where's that? Look? Oh, which one? The fit ends. Yeah, yeah. What about it? Can you view that in in the environment pin and and see what it looks like? Um, is there members? Member fits? No. So member. Huh. Uh, what are you using for? for metrics on your models? I think it was just the mean log. Well, for the classification, it was mean log loss, but I guess with the ensembling, how does it use a metric? <laughs> I guess if it uses, it still uses mean, well, it's still showing log loss here, but like, what does that mean? Like, because the metric for the, the GlimNet model is that going to be different than like the metrics? Because uh, at that point, you're not like actually evaluating the models against each other. I feel like there should just be like one overall metric where it's comparing one ensemble versus another. Well, the wow. names of the metrics are there. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, okay. I think it's just a bunch of yeah, thing, yeah. log loss uh, printouts. It doesn't show the entire thing, but that's, I'm curious, like, Need to, I need this probably better explained, uh, like how it's actually um, using those metrics. Is it like, is it still using them on the submodels? Um, what's being used to, I guess, uh, evaluate the GlimNet model for stacks, I guess? Not sure. I think it, maybe it is still mean log loss because it's still looking at five uh, classes it's trying to predict and you know, something like, I guess accuracy would work as well for that, but um, I think I gave it mean log loss, so it should be still using that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think I think the, uh, the lesson here is like, don't try to do too much here <laughs> unless you're like, uh, yeah, because like at this point, I'm having a little difficulty understanding exactly how it's using those weightings to come up with, you know, nor, uh, normal and fire, or normal and water here, and only those two, because clearly the model is not as good as it could be. And the next part of this would be go back, figure out how we can like actually reduce the, uh, you know, the false negatives or whatever. Uh, at this point, I don't, I mean, I guess I'm also a little like confused by this graph because like, did we lose 
<laughs> some of these other classes as well like i don't i don't know when that happened because um, only truth values are zero so maybe I, is that is that in the test it um how many let's see so we're at 96 oh that has to be in the training set right uh yeah because we use a training set here what if i print out the test set Yeah, at some point we must have like lost some of this data <laughs> because it's showing you no know, actual bug fire in grass. Uh, unless like, I don't know, that got filtered out earlier or something. I mean, bug fire in grass. It's like it converted this to like a binary problem or something. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Uh, okay. Um, Clearly, I don't know what I'm talking about here, so <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> I I think gonna... <laughs> it was a fun experiment. Okay, these are the things you're not supposed to show, like to, to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, very brief. Yes. Yeah. Oh well. It's cool. I'm sorry. Did you say the? <clears throat> test data had those different classes or yeah the so if i look at test data yeah it, it has a pretty equal distribution of those five classes like 27 for water is the most and then fire is the least at 12 but everything else is something in between so yeah i'd have to go look at back at this like where the data was lost I think when I was, you know, writing this, I was like, okay, let me just make sure everything works. I wasn't like actually analyzing it too much. Um, that's interesting. We lost some of that, uh, the actuals. Hey, uh, another quick question. When you were defining model specs, you had F underscore mod. I have never no, seen that before. What is that? Uh, just a, so I just like defined a function to set oh, the mode. That's uh, your function? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll share my screen again. But like basically I just set a wrapper around set mode classification because I don't want to type out classification every time. Uh, <laughs> just a simple dumb thing I do uh, just to save some typing. Uh, okay, thanks. I was scratching my head like, what the hell is that? Never seen that before. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'm curious well, where we go from here, uh, if we do anything else at this point as a book club. Yeah. I think, you know, something I'm interested in is like if we could write, um, I guess, custom recipe steps uh, or like your own specification for a model. Uh, they have, I think, uh, documentation on how to do that. So if we wanted to do combine like advanced R and tidy models, you know, really advanced tidy models, we can do <laughs> something like that. Um, but, you know, otherwise I guess we wait for some of the chapters. They've got stuff uh, like a, a few PRs or yeah, th uh, ensembles, um, prediction, trust, and model explanations all have drafts. So. Nice. Yeah, the model explanation one. You know, I would. I'd love to see that one. Yeah, it's. I tried to, like, um, set it up and build it to to read ahead, but. It's really hard to build this book. Apparently, it takes hours, and you have to, like it doesn't work on Windows. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so I decided not to do that. <laughs> yeah, and that's in fact why I was showing on. I actually didn't even try to download it and like build the book, but that's why I was like showing it on GitHub to commit because I was like, I don't want to like download this and build the book. <laughs> I felt like it was going to be a lot of effort. Right. Uh, Yeah, so I, I don't know, John. I guess uh, maybe it's up to you. Do we just like, I guess, wait till then? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, sliced is happening, so we can 
we can turn this into a slice club. <laughs> yeah, maybe like office hours of pre-sliced or something. Yeah. Uh, what time uh, is sliced? Uh, it's actually it started probably in like, I mean, I think it already started. I don't know. I'd have to open Twitch. I, I loaded Twitch. I'm trying to figure out if I'm screwing something up, but it looks like they haven't actually started, but they're started. Yeah, they, they don't. They don't start till what, eight central or nine ET. Um, okay. But they're. I think this like last ten fifteen minutes beforehand is like when the contestants actually see the data set, so they can like start planning everything. Okay. Yeah. So. I've, uh, I think I was going to write a couple things in like snippets. It'll just like write the entire. Nice. <laughs> for me. I, I think that's probably against the spirit of the competition though. So I wasn't going to actually do that, but maybe in backup in case like I needed it, I could just like blank for some reason. Uh, I think like use models is definitely in, yeah. the, in the spirit. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, that, that's like a, that's five one. I don't think that's like, uh, over doing it it's fair game i guess yeah or just the person i add in but it's not like those um are done like they're not going to get you all the way there you know yeah I mean? so yeah i know I, right. i'm doing it next week so um i probably if we were going to do something i wouldn't i wouldn't be here next week but yeah. exactly I, I mean, <laughs> I didn't think you would be. <laughs> I thought you would yeah. be a little distracted, and I thought all of us should be cheering you on. So that is my vote. Wait, I mean, Julie is also uh, going next week, so I don't know how how does that go work. You know, well, like, but really? you're you're the actual like member of the book club, so <laughs> yeah. I think I, we should uh, we should be rooting for you. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Cool. Uh, that, that makes me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I hope it's not as bad as like today. Just like, oh, here's this predictive model. Oh, it's a it terrible doesn't actually work. <laughs> but the one thing is, I bet almost everyone else would, if they, well, I don't know. I think um, if I went back to the basics, I'd probably, and just like, you know, thought fundamentally about this, just stuck with one model framework, probably would have been better than what I ended up with here with stacks. I think it's probably worthwhile to you know to play with because yeah. it's. I feel like long like if you find the one thing that is wrong in there, it's probably going to do better than it would have done without stacks. Yeah, stacks is cool. So I went back to the very first week of sliced uh, the data set that they gave us, and I remember I did pretty poorly on it. Like uh, with the accuracy, it was like 0.6. It was a binary classification. And so I went and applied the same approach to it uh, before I was doing this multi-class thing. Um, and I got to up to like 0.87 uh, accuracy, <laughs> like much better than what I did. And I think the actual uh, Jordan who I was going up against, he got like 0.9 uh, accuracy. Uh, so I was like, okay, at least that would have been like pretty competitive that week uh, compared to, I think I was trying to use tidy models at the time. <laughs> um, believe it or not, I don't use tidy models all that much just because I don't model all that much. Um, so I was having a hard time, but I was like glad to see stacks gave me like a huge boost in, in terms of accuracy on that data set. Cool. Yeah, I know um, a couple years ago, uh, uh, what's her name? Erin, um, I don't remember her last name, but from H2O. Uh, did some competition where she just used the auto ML from H2O on, in R, the R version of it. And she was beating a bunch of people who were like doing very bespoke models, um, just like running on her laptop. So yeah, Aaron Liddell. Um, so, you know, you could do that, just run H2O. <laughs> they actually explicitly said don't use auto ml <laughs> okay <laughs> but this is kind of like i mean this is going to be the closest i mean ensembling of some sort is going to be the closest you get to that uh, yeah fair 
if we had more than two hours, I could like try every parameter in the world on something. But, yeah. Anyways, I, I'm my goal is to win the uh, storytelling part and the data visualization part because that, that's what I'm actually better at. Huh. I don't know anything actually about it other than <laughs> that it's like a thing that's happening and that you're competing and Julia and a bunch of other are for DS people or at least yeah. a couple other. Well, maybe we should uh, uh, we should all head over there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I'm over there. All right. And Jesse's on there um, in three weeks, I think. Jesse, who yeah. founded her for DS, so we should all also root for her. <laughs> yeah. I'm on board. Oh, wow. 177 people. Wow. <laughs> oh, it's no big deal. There won't be a lot of people. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right guys um, i'm gonna head over there so all right uh, well right. we'll see you there and we'll see you next week yeah on, on sliced <laughs> have a good one everybody all right Thanks, bye Tony.